Well, that was a lovely introduction, Jocelyn. Uh, I don't think you'll be talking to me in two minutes' time, what I'm about to do, but, uh, but thank you anyway. Um, very grateful to be here. Amazed that you actually came back after lunch. Shocking. Um, <laughs> and I'd like you to indulge me in something called a mind-melding exercise. A groupthink exercise. Have you ever done this sort of thing before, where we all try and come to the same answer to a particular question? And the question is, try and think of the most advanced human being on the planet today. The best example of our species. If we were to meet aliens, this is the person that we'd send to represent the human race. So try it. let's see if we can all come to the same consensus. See who comes up. Who... Amazing, Jocelyn Brewer. <laughs> now, while Jocelyn is the most intelligent and advanced of our species, <laughs> she's got a bit of a right hook on her as well, so I better be careful, because it's about to get worse. <laughs> while she uses her logic and her advanced Homo sapiens brain to make decisions, she has a little secret. And that little secret is that she's still thinks, acts, and largely makes decisions like a cavewoman. <laughs> Whatever hair conditioner you're using, stick with it. It's, it's working. <laughs> now look, to be fair to Jocelyn, it's all of us. We all instinctively behave like cave people. And that's because that's what we are still. That's where our brains still are. We have biases, heuristics, thinking traps, intuition, gut feel, system one versus system two, reptilian versus mammalian brains, informing everything we do hundreds of times a day. And the bottom line of what we're trying to do is thrive, is procreate and survive as a species. But it's been two thousandth of a percent of the time since we split with our common ancestor with chimpanzees that we've been living and working in the way we do today. And that's caused some problems. That's caused something called mismatches, physical mismatches. So these physical mismatches, and I apologize for some of the images in advance because they're quite upsetting, but these are from the agricultural revolution. This is from when we stopped moving around, domesticated animals, and started living in close proximity with them. And it led to these diseases. Have you ever wondered why they're called cowpox, swine flu, chicken pox? Influenza came from the waterfowl that we'd domesticated. There's a key problem here. Have you ever wondered why an agricultural civilization, when it goes to a new continent and meets an indigenous forager civilization, up to 80% of that new civilization that's just been exposed to these diseases dies, is wiped out. They haven't had the 12,000 years to get used to these physical changes from living closely with domestic animals. There are also physical mismatches from the industrial and information revolution that we're living with. And you'll recognize these as the biggest killers today in our society. But even things like tooth decay, there's barely any evidence of tooth decay in the fossil record. And yet you find a 16-year-old today that hasn't got a filling. And then finally, my specialism are these psychological mismatches from all of these revolutions. Anxiety, stress, depression. Now, don't get me wrong, these are important, they're necessary, they've been evolutionarily selected in us because they serve a really useful and important purpose, but not to the level and extent at which we're experiencing them in society today. And there are other psychological issues that are being compounded by living the way we do today. Now, I don't want to throw the baby out with a bathwater. I love my air conditioning smartphone and three-ply toilet tissue as much as the next person. But there's something gone fundamentally wrong. And if you really think about it, over the last two days, every single talk we've listened to is about addressing this issue of mismatch. Now, from my decade of research, it's evident that I guess we're, we're, we're fundamentally have these psychological issues, this feeling of hollowness, because of this weird acceleration from millions of years of evolution, or 300,000 years that Homo sapiens has been around, 
And we've suddenly jumped to how we live in the last couple of decades in particular. And for me, from my research, there are three key causes of this, three key Cs, which I'll take you through. And the first one is community. Now, I was driving, or I wasn't driving, I was <laughs> flying from Sydney to London. It would take a bloody long time if I was driving. So I was flying from Sydney to London via Dubai about seven years ago, and I was looking out the window, and, sorry, I, I don't think you quite appreciated that animation. <laughs> it took three hours to do. There we go. Yeah, that's better. Right, <laughs> and as I looked out of the window, I was flying over Iran, and it was this city here, and I found out afterwards it's called Yads. It was established in AD 500, and it was pretty similar. A lot of the old towns throughout the Middle East looked like this, and if you look at it, there's something different there. The whole members of the family would live next to each other, but in their own private areas, they'd have their own courtyard where they'd commune and mix with each other. And this is a pattern you'll see throughout history, from the Amazonian rainforest to China. You'd have villages and settlements in circles. But even in that least sociable of species, the English, they used to centre their villages around a village green. But we've lost something. We don't build cities like this anymore. We, there is a sense of community lost that we're all dealing with. Now, community has a lot of different definitions in the academic literature, but one of the key consistent words is belonging. We've lost a sense of belonging, and there are loads of reasons for this, but I guess it comes down, one of the large ones, to a loss of institutions. We're a much more secular society. We're not congregating as much anymore. Uh, we don't work for the same company for 40 years anymore. We're moving away from our families. I mean, how many of you, probably 50%, don't live in the same town as your family did? You know, we're moving away from our families and we're losing a sense of tribe. And this is profoundly important to us as a species. And the reason for that, uniquely to us as a species, is in the whites of this young man's eyes, literally in the whites of his eyes, in the sclera. We are the only primate out of more than 300 species that have visible sclera. And that serves an evolutionary disadvantage. If you see a ripe fruit, then the people around you can see you looking at it and they can grab it before you. If you see a predator coming and you're looking like that, the people around you can see where you're looking, get out of the way, and you become the prey. So there's an evolutionary disadvantage to the whites of the eyes. The one advantage is in communication, is in understanding what that person you're with is thinking, in empathy. There's a second level to this. There's been some fantastic work by Michael Tomasello on Becoming Human, where chimpanzees will cooperate with each other, our closest living relatives, and they'll work together on what's called a cooperative pulling experiment, where it needs two chimps to be able to pull this apparatus towards them to be able to reach some treats. Now, invariably, one of those chimps will get to the treats first, and they'll grab the treats, go off and consume them. And the other one shuffles off, a little bit upset, no treats. Now, look what happens when humans do this exact same task. Three-year-olds, you can already see they're looking at each other. They're communicating, even non-verbally. And when one of them invariably gets to the treats first, they wait for the other kid to get their treat or help them get their treat. And if one of them gets three and the other one gets one, then they will share them equitably. Now, look, we know we're terrible at self-regulation, me in particular, but I think it's the bottom of those 24 via character strengths that 21 million people have completed that survey. It's the least common of the top character strengths. So we're terrible at self-regulation for me, but we're fantastic at it for we. And this is essential. This is part of our being because we need to contribute. I'll explain the second of the C's now. This is my adorable son, Ollie Olsen. A year ago, when he was four, um, we were getting ready. You know what it's like when you're getting ready to go to school, do the school run, go to work, had to take Ollie swimming, his older brother Hudson, we had to take him to school. Have I fed the dog? Where's your shoes? We're out the door. We've got two cars. We've got three mortgages. We're running around. And then where's Ollie? And we heard a clatter in the kitchen. And so we went running into the kitchen 
And there's Ollie with the tap full on. He'd pull the stool up so he could reach the dirty washing and was wanting to wash up. And we went, Ollie, no! <laughs> Put it down, God, we've got to get you changed now. God, we haven't got time for this. Come on. Now, poor Ollie has an offer to help with a single chore in over a year now. <laughs> And who can blame him, though? Because we're not giving him the time to nurture, to contribute. It's not Ollie, it's a natural human desire to contribute. Studies show that if you give a three-year-old a lovely brand new toy that they're overjoyed with, they will play with it. But if somebody walks into that room and drops something and is struggling to pick it up, the three-year-old will discard a brand new toy and go and help that person, even if it's a stranger, pick it up. So yes, we have empathy, but we also have altruism, which makes us the most cooperative species that I can find, notwithstanding any others like termites or dolphins in the world. This fella here is a lovely guy. He's called Manuel. He was born, I was chatting to him three weeks ago in Catherine. He was born in the bush in Catherine. Uh, he's an elder. He, he um, works for Top Dig Cultural Experience. And he was saying to me, I don't know how old I am. And I said, well, that must mess with your brain. He says, nah, it doesn't matter really. Um, when I grew whiskers, that's when it was time for me to hang out with my dad more, to go hunting with the rest of the adults. It was the same for the girls. When they hit puberty, they hung out with the adults. Now, what really struck me about what he was telling me was that when our kids become adolescents or teens, we kind of segregate them a bit more. We split them right at the time when they need peers, such as adults, to start to learn how to emulate, how to contribute to their society. Kids, teens, are often called antisocial. <laughs> took me ages to set this photo up. So. <laughs> but they're not. They're the exact opposite. Children, teenagers are hypersocial. They're observing everything around them, finding their place in society, seeing what they can contribute. And right at the time when they need adults to learn from and to emulate and to become like, we take ourselves away, we segregate them largely. Now, Mitch Princeton has done some fantastic work on popularity. You may have heard of this. And he said there's two kinds that teens crave. There's likability, which you earn. You earn by being nice, by contributing. And then there's status. And this you get, maybe you de developed physically a little bit earlier. Maybe you're a bit richer, you've got all the best stuff. Maybe you're a bit of a bully, you put other people down. You've got status. And children, teens, now look to these people to emulate. These are their peers because we've taken ourselves, adults, out of the equation largely. We haven't given them an opportunity to develop self-worth by contributing to our families, to our communities. If you ever hang out with an indigenous forager society, if you ever watch a documentary, it's quite marked how much the kids mix with adults, but how much an eight-year-old will be doing to help out a six-year-old or how much a seven-year-old is running around with a sharp knife, and I'm going, oh my God, but they're actually safer with it and better at using it than I am. They're developing self-worth. They're finding out what their strengths and virtues are, and they're contributing them to their communities. And self-worth is an absolutely essential thing we have to instill in our teens and our children in order to be able to cope with comparison. Now, comparison's a bloody good thing. Comparison is a pole vault to learning, to accelerating learning. But with social media, it's a big stick with which we beat ourselves, and it impacts our mental health. It's what I call the Kardashian complex. For most of human history, we've compared ourselves to 20 or 30 other people in our immediate family, or 200 in our wider tribe or village. Now we're comparing ourselves to 7.9 billion other human beings, the fastest, the fittest, the pertest buttocks. That's what I look for, anyway. Um, <laughs> the most successful, the most intelligent, and it leads to an inevitable feeling of inadequacy. And we haven't developed the self-worth to be vulnerable enough to deal with this sense of inadequacy, to deal with this comparison. There's a further problem with keyboard jockeys. Now, look, we know the voice inside our head is usually negative. We've got a negativity bias, the internal chatter is, inside our car, which is an extension of our craniums. It's usually quite negative. 
Online, when you don't have to look someone in the eyes, people are more likely to troll someone. So this is interesting because how do you deal with that if you've got a hundred comments on your social media post and one is negative? That's the one you remember, isn't it? We just focus on that. And you can deal with it if you've developed self-worth, virtues, strengths that you know you're contributing to your society. Now there's something here in Australia called tall poppy syndrome. But don't be down on yourself. Tall poppy syndrome is a thing that we've selected, we've evolved as a human. You will find it in all indigenous foraging societies today, which is a good proxy for how we've lived for most of human history, that they have a similar policy. Say you've got a great hunter, and he comes trotting back into the, t the village. I don't know why he'd walk like that. but you know, Ah, because he's got an antelope on his shoulders, and he throws it down, and he's standing all proud. If people perceive his head is getting too big, if he's getting too big for his boots, the response from the village isn't, oh, wow, thanks a lot for that. It's, is that it? What a tiddler. And anthropologists have recorded this everywhere. They bring people down to do anything to maintain an egalitarian society where nobody is too big for their own boots. And the hunter takes it in the right spirit because he's developed self-worth. He knows what he's contributing and he doesn't have to big himself up to feel it. And that seems totally contrary to how we behave in our modern society. So look, I've given you these three C's, these three causes of unhappiness. So being an eternal optimist, I have to give you three A's, three actions on what we can do about it. And first of all is just the awareness of what we've been sharing and speaking about changes your behavior. Is that third house or mortgage worth it? Because when you're on your deathbed, you won't be saying, oh, that was lovely, that third house I visited twice a month. Or will you be saying, I should have spent more time with my kids? But the second one's really pragmatic. Business dictates and really massively influences our lives, our society. And what influences them is literally the bottom line. It's profit and loss, it's the dollar. And we've got to harness that. Some businesses are great, they're saying, well, let's try and do a four-day week. But we need a four-day week with our kids off of school one day to actually really benefit from that. But what we need then is the government to not just have token well-being statements. We need them to start using fiscal incentives to benefit businesses that do things to improve society, to improve community. Because if they do that, then the government has lower expenditure on healthcare, education, and incarceration. And if you start giving tax incentives back to businesses that are doing right by society, then it will start an upward spiral. And I guess that's it. I mean, my message overall is time. Just try and take more time for your family, for your kids, for your teens in particular. Try and spend more time to learn your skills, your values, your virtues, and give those to your communities, because that's what's key. And if we have this bottom-up movement that's matched by some top-down, genuine government commitment, then we're actually going to be able to rediscover the meaning and purpose in our lives that is the true root, the true cause of happiness for us as a society. Thank you. <laughs>